the history of the world is interconnected. Empires rise and fall and rise again. One side's failure is often a boon for another. Case point, the Mongol invasion of Java, the Mongol army's most embarrassing failure. So let me tell you the story of how the Mongol army failed so hard at invading a kingdom, they actually created an even more powerful empire. The Mongol invasion of Java took place in 1292. But to establish the context, let's jump a few years back. In 1260, Kublai Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan, became the fifth great Khan of the Mongol Empire. In 1271, he established the Mongol Chinese Yuan Dynasty. And by 1279, the 64 years old Khan had conquered the rest of China. To extend his influence, he sent out envoys far and wide to demand the submission of neighboring kingdoms and turn them into his tributaries. One of these kingdoms happened to be Tumapel, which is more commonly known as Singosari, a name derived from its capital city. This unassuming little kingdom located on the island of Java, which is part of Indonesia today, was actually quite influential during the time. Like Kublai, its king, Kertonegoro, was also a conqueror himself. Even though Singosari did not control much land, it controlled quite a few facile states and a large swathe of the sea around it, which meant the lucrative Southeast Asian trading route. So when Kublai's envoys came to demand him to send his family members to China as hostage in 1279, he had the courage to just ignore them. But they just kept pestering him, sending multiple missions, until in 1289, Kertonegoro finally snapped. He cut off the envoy's ears and burned his face with branding iron before sending him back as his final message. Obviously, this greatly offended Kublai. Harming a Mongol envoy was a big no-no. So he had to send a punitive expedition to make him pay for the grave insult. But ever since his conquest of China, Kublai's win-loss ratio had taken a nosedive from the failed invasion of Japan to the disastrous second and third invasion of Vietnam, nothing ever seemed to go right for the Mongols, especially when water and boats were involved. So this time he put a little more care into the planning of the invasion. First of all, they were given one year's worth of supply. Obviously, he didn't want the whole broken supply line fiasco that happened in Vietnam to be repeated again. Additionally, because the equatorial climate of Java was unbearably hot and humid for the average Mongols, the troops was mostly made up of Chinese. The newly conquered southern Chinese, who were more acclimatized to the warmer weather, was also included. You know, this is the sad truth about the Mongol horde. Most of the time, the bulk of their army was composed of other subjugated people. It is not because there is an endless supply of Mongols, so in some great battles against the Mongols, many of the times they weren't even fighting the real Mongols. In this case, the bulk of the invading force actually came from northern China. The generals in charge, however, was a Mongolian. And an Uyghur. And a Chinese. And no, they didn't walk into a bar. At least not yet. As they were planning this invasion, however, troubling events was brewing in Singosari. Jayakatwang, the ruler of Singosari's vassal kingdom of Kadiri, launched a rebellion. He successfully defeated Singosari and killed its ruler, Kertonegoro. Kertonegoro's son-in-law, Raden Wichoyo, survived the rebellion, but his small group of resistance fighters was no match for the Kadiri force, so he had to temporarily make peace with Jayakatwang to survive. To do so, he went to the Sumenep area of Madura Island and sought the help of Arya Wiraraja, the king's former advisor and shaman, to mediate a peace deal. Now, Arya was quite a schemer. In fact, he was the one who prodded Jayakatwang to rebel. So why would he help Raden, Kertonegoro's son-in-law now? Perhaps because he knew there was something special about him 
This may sound like a plot out of a fantasy novel with bad TV adaptation, but Raden was actually the descendant of the first ruler of Singosari, Ken Arok. But throughout the years, the throne had been wrested away from the direct descendants of Ken Arok. So to secure his assistance, Raten promised Arya half of the kingdom if he helped him regain the throne. Arya agreed. Then he negotiated the peace treaty, or terms of surrender, depending on how he wanted to spin it. In fact, the negotiation was so successful, Raten was allowed back to Java and was settled in the forest of Tarek. As Raden gathered more supporters, he established a village there and called it Maja Bait. He got the name because someone ate a Maja fruit there and said that it was bitter. So Maja Bait literally means bitter Maja. Meanwhile, back on the Mongol side, they were taking their sweet time preparing. And along the way, they also took a few detours to convince the Malayu and Sumatran kingdoms to send their tributes. By the time they reached Java in 1293, with their 20,000 strong army, they were surprised to find that the political landscape had completely changed. The king they were supposed to punish was already dead, and there is even a new guy ruling the place. So what were they supposed to do now? Luckily, Raden was there to elucidate them. He convinced them that he was the rightful ruler of Singosari, and promised that he would be a good and obedient vassal and send them all the tributes they could ever want, once they restored him to the throne. Well, seeing that they have come all this way ready for war, they might as well fight it. So Raden combined forces with them and handily took out Jayakatwang in Daha, Kadiri's capital. Actually, when Raden said combined forces, he really just meant guarding the rear. So the UN forces did most of the hard work and took the most damage. Uh, anyway, now that they've won and captured Jayakatwang's family, this is no time to bicker. It is time to celebrate. So the UN forces did just that and started looting. When Raden told them that he was going back to Majapai to bring them the reward he promised, one of the generals thought that this was obviously a terrible idea. That exhausted and drunken troops would be left defenseless if they are suddenly attacked. And Raden had been acting quite suspiciously lately. So he had Raden accompanied by a group of soldiers and officers as he ran his errands. Lo and behold, his suspicion proved to be right. After some weeks of planning, Raden's men ambushed and took out his UN overseers. He then launched a surprise attack on the UN occupied Daha and wrecked the completely unaware UN soldiers, forcing them to flee. Mamposlu! But Raden wasn't done yet. He kept mounting the pressure and harassed them along the way until they dropped most of their ill gotten loots. When the UN forces finally returned to China with their captives and what little loot they had left, they incurred the Khan's wrath. Their measly gain could not offset the embarrassment of their defeat and how they were played by Raden into doing his dirty work. As for Raden, this victory gained him enough goodwill to establish his own kingdom, Matsabai, and Arya's province was given a special status for the assistance he rendered. The UN soldiers' gunpowder weaponry also left quite an impression on the Javanese. So eventually, the kingdom of Matsabai will grow into a powerful maritime empire that will control most of the archipelago, powered by gunpowder. Their rise was also made possible by the death of Kublai Khan the next year, 1294. His successor, Tamur Khan, enacted a policy of great forgiveness. He made peace with Dai Viet and he also normalized the Yuan dynasty's relations with other kingdoms. So, without the pressure of another Mongol attack, Matabai had the free reign to expand. This is why it is important to look at history holistically. Not even a literal island nation is free from the influences and machinations of faraway states. In this case, a routine act of exacting tribute by Kublai Khan 
passed on gunpowder technology to Java and unwittingly created a powerful sea empire down south. And this is part of what we do on this channel. We don't just talk about the history of individual nations. We also take into account the context these events occur in and the interconnectedness of world history. So if you like the sound of what we're doing, then subscribe because we release a video every week. Until next time, stay cool, my bros.